Assalamu alaikum everyone and uh, welcome to Blogging Theology um, and this event obviously is hosted by the Cambridge University uh, Islamic Society and I'm deeply honoured to be joined today by Ahmed Paul uh, Keeler. Assalamu alaikum sir. Wa alaikum. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> and for those who don't know, probably everyone in this room obviously knows the gentleman very well, but those who don't know uh, who are watching this, I'll just uh, give a very brief intro to, to your life. Uh, Ahmed Paul Keeler was born in 1942 and christened Paul Godfrey. Uh, he was brought up during the 1940s and 50s in a conservative, upper-middle-class Anglo-Catholic family. A chance meeting with a master musician from India introduced him to a wonderful new cultural realm. In response, he formulated and organised the World of Islam Festival that took place in London in 1976 and was opened by Her Majesty the Queen and was the most comprehensive exposition of Islamic culture ever to have taken place in the West. Six months before the festival, Paul embraced Islam. He is now lecturing and participating in seminars, encouraging us to judge the success of human culture through the, the criteria of Mizan, this concept of Mizan, which is at the heart of the Islamic unfolding. Islam and the West have been neighbours now for what, over 1,400 years. The West grew up under the shadow of Islam, and then after the Renaissance, in a dramatic reversal of roles, the West became world conquerors and subdued all other cultures and civilizations, including Islam. This transformation ushered in the modern world, a world unlike any that had existed before. All nations are now judged according to their scientific progress, technological development and economic growth. And yet, humanity is now experiencing multiple crises that are threatening our very existence. We all know about this. Population explosion, financial, social and political instability, which we are experiencing very traumatically at the moment, the alarming growth of mental illness, the threat of nuclear annihilation and climate change all loom over humanity like a dark cloud. Simultaneously, the world is witnessing a dangerous escalation in the polarization between Islam and the West. And this polarization we're seeing is becoming even more acute as we speak. In uh, his thought-provoking book, which I'm sure you've all seen, this is the copy, um, Rethinking Islam and the West, A New Narrative for the Age of Crises. In his book, uh, Ahmed invites us to view the crises we are facing and the tangled relationship between Islam and the West through a different lens. He proposes that the true yardstick for measuring success should be the balance achieved between the spiritual, social and material needs of humanity a balance which makes it possible to live in harmony with nature. When the world is viewed from this perspective, a completely different picture of Islam and the West emerges. So, by way of introduction, um, Ahmed, I'd like to ask you this question. The Mizan thesis is arguably the central concept uh, of your book. Could you define this rich concept and this rich idea and how you see it as the solution to the multiple crises facing the world today? Well, let me start by saying that the book doesn't put it forward as the solution to the crises. The whole perspective is to basically change our understanding of the world the world, particularly the West and Islam, through a complete change of perspective, mm. a completely separate, a different viewpoint. The, the, the one very important thing about the thesis is the complete separation between the modern world the West, in, in, in its manifestation as modern, mm. and the world of Islam. Mm. These are two completely separate worlds. And at the moment, we are seeing Islam, in terms of its unfolding, 
through Western eyes. Mm. Because the world of Islam, which existed for more than a thousand years as a complete world, was conquered. Mm. It was then literally destroyed. The civilization was destroyed and replaced by the West, by this modern world that we are now in, in, encased in. And so the Muslim was basically conquered. And when you are conquered, you start to behave and you start to be, see things in terms of the conqueror. Mm. And the Western system of education, the Western way of looking at the world, the Western system of commerce, of trade, the social order, all of this now is modern. Mm. And this happened gradually. Yeah. Modernity began with the Industrial Revolution throughout the whole of the Victorian period. It was simply making things. Mm. It was making textiles and, and other things. And then gradually it started to build its own complete world. It took, off to the, it took over the realm of architecture. But this was in the uh, beginning of the 20th century. It took over the world of art. It, of course, completely took over the world of commerce and finance and created its own financial and, and commercial world. It took over gradually the world of education. During the 19th century, science was not taught at the universities. It was st the, the, the Latin and Greece was, uh, Greek was still king. Mm. And it's only then, uh, European history wasn't taught. It was only a civilizational history of the Greeks and the, cl and the classics which are taught. So little by little it came and, and started to take, sociology was introduced, all these ologies came into being. And little by little, when I was young in, in, the, in the 40s and 50s, the moral realm was completely in the hands of Christianity. It was Christian. In the universities, they were teaching civilization. Now, modernity has produced its own morality. Mm. The Christian morality is complete, it's finished. The new morality of modernity is that. So modernity has gradually grown and developed into a complete system, a complete structure which now encases the human being. Mm -hmm. And the Misan thesis, mm. as it comes at this moment in time, it's very, it's, it's a very, very appropriate to now because one thing that we can all experience and that is that we're out of balance. We've lost our relationship with the natural world. We're out of balance. Human societies are out of balance. The balance between men and women is out of balance. Everything, we experience it. Every day of our lives we experience it in so many different domains. So at this mo moment in time, it's a beautiful, beautiful principle. And the principle of Mizan is so much richer than the idea of balance. In Islam, it includes the uh, justice, right. measure, harmony. It's a sacred so it's social, it's political, it's environmental, and everything, it's, and, and an inner harmony as well. It's not everything. Just the, it's, the, it's the whole basis of our being. So, what is the, is the particularly Islamic etiology of this concept? I mean, is there anything in the Quran, for example, that we can reference um, that might help to clarify? Let me this? just let me just read this uh, little piece, if you'll forgive me, um, from your book, from my book. I haven't read this since I wrote You haven't book, read your book, you said? Not since I wrote it. <laughs> so you'll have to forgive me if I... Yeah. In this comparative study of Islam and the West, I shall draw on the Islamic articulation of the concept of balance, represented by the Arabic term mizan, which can be translated as balance, justice, measure, harmony, or indeed weighing scales. It is a term which contains a spiritual dimension that is not conveyed by our secular understanding of balance. In what follows, I shall use the two, term, two words mizan and balance interchangeably with an awareness of the enhanced meaning contained in the Arabic. So basically, the whole book is looking at the West 
and Islam from this perspective of Mizan. The primacy of Mizan and some dimensions of its meaning are presented in the 55th chapter of, or surah of the Quran, Al-Rahman, the All-Merciful. He raised the heavens and set up everything in balance, Mizan. Interesting. So that you should not transgress the balance, Mizan. Therefore, maintain just measure and do not fall short in the balance, Mizan. And the, what happens when you break the balance is chaos. Everything f goes into chaos. And this is where the, the beautiful, many of the uh, wonderful uh, books now on numbers, which are showing how everything in creation, mm. every bird, every beast, every plant, everything is governed by this concept of mizan, of balance. Because when something is out of it, like with the body, disease is when the mizan is broken mm -hmm. of the body. When the body starts to malfunction, it's because it's out of balance. So this concept is one which is deeply uh, embedded and, and centrally manifested in Islam, but of course is in every culture and civilization. Yes, because there's a, a, a sense that it's not unique to Islam, this Absolutely concept. One, it reminds me of more Eastern philosophies and outlooks, which is, which is uh, a testimony to the universality of the concept. But uh, if I may, if I may just change tack slightly, uh, ha having read this, uh, this book, one of the remarkable aspects of this book, I think, is the author's ability to pithily summarize highly complex subjects. For example, uh, your, your discussion of what, what you call, and I quote, the defining characteristic of Western civilization with its vesting of sovereignty in the individual. This idea of individual sovereignty. And if I may, I just want to quote uh, a couple of passages from this, because if we want to understand the genealogy, if you like, the, uh, the where we have come from in the West, ideologically, intellectually, the movements, the ideas that are fed into modernity, because they, didn't, they came from somewhere. And what I like about y your book is the way, as I say, you pithily summarize this in a really accessible way, which is why I wanted to quote, just to share the gem, if I may, with you. And on page uh, 54, you say, um, but it was Luther, this is Martin Luther, the German reformer, of course, it was Luther who paved the way for what was to become the defining characteristic of Western civilization, with the vesting of sovereignty in the individual. This is explained in uh, Richard Rex's book, The Making of Martin Luther. Quote, Luther's central doctrine, justifica justification by faith alone, uh, sola fide, was meant to give each individual believer absolute certainty of enjoying the grace and favor of God. The underlying individualism of what would later be termed the personal relationship with God passed into the DNA of liberal Protestantism and from there into most facets of Western culture. Really helpful insight there in a very sim simple way of Martin Luther's sort of seminal idea of the individual before God, no longer kind of Western Christendom and, 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 uh, and in the Catholic uh, world, it's a very individual. And then you quote uh, Immanuel Kant, uh, Kant then cemented the idea of individual autonomy in his definition of the Enlightenment. So we've gone from the Reformation now to the later Enlightenment. You quote Kant, Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-incurred immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's own understanding without the guidance of another, says Kant. The motto of enlightenment is therefore sapere orde, which is Latin for have courage to use your own understanding. That's Kant. Then you continue. This abandonment of authority was a reaction to the abuse of power by despotic kings and the endless religious disputes engulfing Christianity. Kant's investing the individual with an essentially subjectivist rational sovereignty would have far-reaching consequences further down the line. Being himself a pietist Lutheran, 
count. He could not imagine what would happen when faith was taken out of the equation and religion as well, with its moral prohibitions and parked in a siding, as you put it. A hundred years later, Friedrich Nietzsche could see it. And you quote Nietzsche here, and this is the end of the quote. God is dead, said Nietzsche. God remains dead, and we have killed him, yet his shadow still looms. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world had yet owned had bled to death under our, our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves?" End quote. So here you brilliantly, I think, encapsulate in a few words the Renaissance, uh, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, and then secular modernity. And this is, the, the, in a sense, the, uh, uh, in a very simple way, the genealogy of our age, ending with Nietzsche and this, this kind of grotesque denial of what is axiomatic to humanity, which, of course, is the existence of a creator. So yeah. um, I just want to thank you for that. Do you want to add anything to that extraordinary? Yeah, it sounds very good, doesn't it? It does. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but, but what I'm trying to say is, yeah. it's so important that we, we as Muslims and uh, as human beings, understand why, w how we got here. It didn't just come about from nowhere, and it's not natural. It's not like a law of physics. It is the end process of a complex intellectual movement that had its origins in Luther and Kant and, and so on. And we find our, and, and it is located geographically and historically in one particular corner of the earth, Europe, or Western Europe, in fact, yeah. in Germany, in Britain, and uh, mainly, and France to some extent with the French Revolution. So uh, just to demystify and de universalize it, it's become the dominant paradigm, but it's very particular and local mm. globally, isn't it? I think the, mm. this is very helpful, but the, it shows completely how. The modern world has come out of the human imagination. Exactly, exactly. It's come out of the philosophical mind. Not revelation. Not revelation. Right. And it comes out of the terrific, I mean, in the book I talk about the three worlds, the Christian, the civilized, the modern, that the West is not one world, it's these three quite separate worlds. Mm. And the birth of modernity really comes out of the collapse of Christianity, mm. of Christendom. Yep. And you can trace it very clearly. Exactly. You know, in, in terms of the, the, you know, the process, how, how it came into being. Yep. And we have now reached the point where, uh, when I was young, modernity still had a glow about it. You know, it was still, we, we still felt ourselves completely in control. Mm -hmm. Now, we're sitting in a university which is engaged in things which are simply horrific in the laboratories. The whole development... What do you mean? What are you probably talking well, about? I, 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 I'm talking particularly um, about the way the, the reasoning mind, which was separated in the West. Mm. Before the reasoning mind was attempting to understand the Creator. Mm. Right. Then with Luther, finally, because it's, it, it, it's, it got to a problem. It came up upon, upon the problem of the Incarnation. Mm. And the logical mind couldn't deal with it. So basically, the, why Luther is so important is that Luther banishes Re the reasoning mind right. from religion. Because it's faith alone, is it? It's, support, it's faith simple alone. faith and, and not and, the and, and Because you mm. can't understand it. Yeah. So the reasoning mind then goes down into the area where it can easily understand, which is the material, or thinks it can understand, which is the material world. And you get this birth of empiricism. Mm. Yeah. And you get the division with, with Descartes between empiricism and and uh, idealism, idealism and, and, and uh, rationalism. Mm. And suddenly, the, um, uh, you get this mind, this new mind, because it's a completely new mind. With Francis Bacon, with these characters, mm. they had this new mind which is completely separated from the spiritual. Mm. And it's this reasoning mind uh, away from 
separated. And it's looking at the material world and it's wanting to conquer it. The conquest of nature. And one of the very important principles of the Misan thesis is this principle, the phonic principle, which is the deeper you go into the material realm, the greater that the powers, the greater the powers are released and the more devastating the unintended consequences. The unintended consequences. So, so much of our problems isn't it, is unintended, unintended consequences. We plan and we, we think ahead and that things don't happen the way we yeah. intended. Yeah. And you had this, character, mm. this tragedy of Einstein mm. who came up with this wonderful theorem mm. and he didn't realize it but it led to the atom bomb. Yeah. And he was devastated. Yeah. And this is the problem. He'd gone very deep into, into, into matter. Matter devoid of all that protects our reasoning mind. Right. Because our reasoning mind is protected by revelation. Right. And this is where the, uh, the, the, the full sort of horror of what we're now facing has come about. I mean, one of the examples, because uh, we're facing many things at the moment. Many things are coming to a head at this time. One of them is that there's this civil war between modern science and modern philosophy. Oh, yes. Modern science is saying we are completely, men and women are completely separate beings. Because yeah. of chromosomes, for example, yes. DNA. Physically. This is scientific, objective. It's a scientific, right. objective, mm -hmm. empirical understanding of the body. The philosophy is saying, no, we are, we are Social sovereigns. We are the sovereign of ourselves. We are the sovereigns. Mm. And we are the ones who decide what we are. Mm. And you get this fantastic thing meeting in this gender issue. And individual autonomy, by the way, is there rooted in Kant, who we mentioned before, ultimately all coming in Martin through. Luther. It's all working itself through, isn't it? Right through to, yeah. the, to the sovereignty of the individual. Mm. So now this sovereignty of the individual has, has actually trumped science. Mm. Mm -hmm. you know, our ideas of what we are and what we think we are has trumped science. Remarkable. Which is incredible. So there are many things which are happening, but the, the, uh, the Misan thesis allows you to see this. The Misan thesis allows you to see mm. where the balance is breached. Because as soon as the balance is breached, crises begin to unfold. And those crises can take a long time. It's like when the uh, Pope was convinced by the richest man at the time, who's uh, Fugger, he's a German, Fugger, who convinced him to raise the ban on, on uh, usury. Right? And uh, the Pope at the time happened to be a Medici. Mm. And we all know they came from a banking family. Yeah. And the uh, usury was, was uh, lifted. Which of course is prohibited in the Jewish scriptures. Of uh, all, in the it's, it, it, it inhabited, it's all of the religions. Mm. Why? Because the minute you start that debt usury game, mm. you start spending the future you start spending the future. And you don't have the responsibility or the authority from Almighty Allah to spend the future. The future belongs to the future, not to you. Gosh. So this is why we are now in a situation where generations now, because the whole of the modern world is supported by debt. Yeah. And partic Every, particularly the, 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 the global south, which is encumbered by great debt from... The biggest uh, debt, <coughs> the debt in Asia is, is America. Mm. $23 trillion of debt. The whole world is functioning on, in terms of debt. So the whole world has, has spent the future. And this is again uh, links into the environmental crisis. Because the destruction of the environment is that we've spent the future of it. We've destroyed it. So, the Misan thesis allows us to see very, very clearly the nature of modernity. Mm. And for Muslims, it's very important in order to be able to see this. Because we, we are encompassed by it. Mm. Our thinking is absolutely uh, saturated, saturated in it. Yeah. You know? 
our education from child has been in it <coughs> and that and modernity is now mm. in 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 a, in a crisis which is ever growing mm. it's multiplying mm. and the way that we can destroy ourselves is multiplying the, the the destruction of the social orders and the political orders all of this is taking place but then we have to look at it and say for the muslim what does this mean for the muslim mm. that's the most important part this is the area where, in terms of the Mizan thesis, we have to understand what is the role of Islam in our age. And this is where we come to the, uh, the, the understanding that in terms of Islam, it's the witness, it's, uh, we are in the age of witness and refuge. We're in a massive storm. Imagine the storm. And you have lighthouses which warn people of the rocks. You have untruth. You have falsehood which is swirling around and, and, and gathering everybody into this chaos. You have Islam. You have the religion which is completely intact. Well, this is, this is actually worth emphasizing. You say completely intact because it is not inevitable that it should be so. Uh, I mean, I spoke to uh, Professor uh, Linda Woodhead from King's College, a sociologist of religion, uh, a few months ago on Blondie Theology, and, and she, uh, she was commenting on the, the census in, in Britain that had just been published earlier in the year. And all the, you know, the religions are in free fall. People are not going to church anymore. Uh, we're becoming apparently much more secular society. But the big exception to this is Islam Absolutely. actually? And this Absolutely. is a remarkable success story. Yeah. Uh, and, and I was told that you know the initial migrants to this country in the 40s and 50s uh, may have built some some of the mosques and the infrastructure and the halal restaurants and so on, but they weren't that practicing apparently. That their children uh, were more practicing, but today's young people are even more practicing and are much more practicing the Deen. I mean, you know, following the Quran and the Sunnah. And this is remarkable. It's counterintuitive. This shouldn't be happening, but it is happening. Uh, and and that, this yeah. is remarkable. So just to substantiate, the religion now is in. We don't get. I don't get the impression the Muslim youth that that we meet are in any way uh, infected or transformed by the the secular liberal mores. That they're very much holding on to the Deen despite everything, which I think is a remarkable phenomenon. The, the, the incredible thing about Islam is the first age of Islam, mm. which is the age of revelation. In 23 years, the Prophet وسلم, he received the revelation of the Holy Quran over 23 years. It took 23 years for the, for the revelation to be, uh, reve uh, reve uh, to be fully manifested. And it was manifested to a complete humanity, a complete society, which had all the different types of, hu of, of, of human beings. It had warriors, it had merchants, it had people who were of you know, high intellect, it had farmers, it had nomads, it had craftsmen, all the different types were there. So what happened was a complete new way of life which took us back to how we should live upon this earth was fully manifested and put into practice with the best example. And every single one of those companions coming from all the different types of human beings loved the Prophet ﷺ. He was their hero. So when he died, when he departed, the complete structure mm. of how you live on this earth properly was there. Mm. And for any Muslim, all that knowledge is with us. Intact. Intact. Mm. The love of the Prophet Sallallahu the Hadith, the Holy Quran, the pillars of Islam, the way of life. And, it, it, uh, and the first 13 years of the Prophet's ma uh, uh, mission w was in Mecca under persecution. Mm. It was in the house. The religion was in the house and swirling around that house was untruth, was, was persecution, mm. 
was a, was idolatry was a horrible uh, world. Mm -hmm. So you're doesn't drawing, that, you're drawing, a, you're drawing a parallel, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, doesn't yeah. that remind you of how yes. we are today? <laughs> yes. We are living in a world in which this uh, swirling of untruth mm. and, and, and uh, insanity is swirling around, and it's getting deeper. Mm. It's getting more and more and worse and worse. Mm. I mean, during my lifetime, it's unbelievable the scale in which it has, has, uh, there's this whole uh, the storm has erupted and, and gone deeper and deeper and deeper. But of course, it goes back 500 years, but it's, it's taken time. Yeah. Now it's in its state where the machine, which is the creation of the m reasoning, the, uh, the, the, uh, this ma mind, this new mind that was formed, the machine, which is their creation, is now entering a new phase in which it is alive in itself. Mm -hmm. And it's taking over, it's go going everywhere. So the so this um, the Muslim is in a position where their religion is completely intact. They have the citadel, no. but their understanding of the world that we're living in, their understanding of their own history, is confused. Because it's been written by Orientalists. Of course, they've uh, seen uh, it through uh, the eyes of things. Yeah. So what happens is that then the, the next great age of Islam, which is the with more than a thousand years of Dar al-Islam, the abode of Islam, mm. is hazy. It's strange. It's a, it's been sort of taken up in the kind of modern idea of history, which is this endless, you know, change. Everything is you know, gathering into the same sway of, of of this sort of you know horizontal path pathway, and Islam just gets caught up in that as a kind of river into this this whole idea of history. Mm -hmm. And this is something where you then get the um, dominant theme. The dominant theme of modernity, which is the theme of progress, yeah. and the, the, the Whig history of progress, yeah. which developed in the in the 19th century, and that idea gave Islam a role, which was in the development of this glorious scientific technological world. Islam had a golden age, like an age of when you know the Muslims were discovering everything. And they were working out how you make soap so you can keep clean, and they were working out all these wonderful things. And they had this golden age, and then they went into the, they 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 suddenly handed it over to the Europeans with the Renaissance. The Renaissance went sky high, and the Muslims went into a thousand years of of stagnation and decline. And now the Muslims have to wake up, they have to sort of come out of their dream and, and, and catch up and become a part of the developed world. And that is the story. That's the story. And you think that's completely wrong, of course. Well, it's, 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 it's nonsense. Yeah. It's, it's completely nonsense because it's as nonsense as the idea of progress and it is as false as the modern world that has been created. Because the progress, the so-called progress, has led us to this, this storm that you keep on talking yeah, about of yeah. environmental decline and catastrophe, everything, breakdown everything. of the family, confu confusion about gender roles, everything. the irreligion and materialism and so on and so on and so on. And you see, because, so, the, <clears> because the modernity has fragmented the human mind. Mm. Because the human mind is now like an open, you might talk about the open, open plan brain. You know? It's, 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 it, 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 is con it is incapable of seeing things whole. Yeah. And, that, that, and the, the great problem of that is that it can see these different problems. In terms of the modern world now, you've got Western critiques who are criticizing every aspect, the financial problems. You, know, you can see the doomsday in every area. They'll be telling you about the, the, the financial thing melting down, top economics, people, you know, the religious aspect, everything. For the Muslim, we have something which is very, very important, and that is the unity, the oneness. This is something which is absolutely central to Islam. It's the revelation of the one. The Tawheed, of course. The wholeness. It is this concept of wholeness. It is, it, is, it is one ex existence, one creation. And that's where we have a, 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 a tremendous position from which to be able to understand. But we have to recover our understanding of the past. 
we have to know what actually happened because what is, is the, the story of today is a false story. It's nonsense. It's, it's a world that, that has you know, literally been, it's a fabrication of the human imagination. When you start to look through Mizan at Dar al-Islam, this world that was created, history for the West has no purpose. Mm. The unfolding of Islam has a supreme purpose. And on that point, but I just want to reference there's a, a famous uh, British commentator, conservative anti-Muslim called Douglas Murray, um, and he read a book called The Strange Death, or The Strange Suicide, I think it was, of Europe, uh, several years ago, which I read. And, you know, he's an atheist, um, but, but he's a quite in intelligent thinker when he's not bashing Muslims and Islam, but, um, but his diagnosis of Europe was similarly pessimistic, that the, the, the Western European civilization had lost its purpose, its meaning. Mm. It, it was an existential crisis, asking what, what is the point anymore of our story in the West? And he said, there is none. Mm. And he, he traced the genealogy, the same narrative that we have. But because he is an, uh, has no faith, it has nothing, he has nothing to offer. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you take this narrative, one Englishman to another Englishman, but you continue with a solution, actually, with, with uh, 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 that, is, that is a dean. Uh, you, it, it's a form of dawah, really, isn't it, you're offering here, a form of knowledge, uh, information about Islam as a solution to this absence of meaning and purpose that the West is suffering that's from. It, that's important. It's, it's, it's the meaning. It's a purpose, because the, for the Muslim, the, the whole unfolding of Islam into Dar al-Islam was to create a world in which the manifestation, the revelation, could be lived mm. by all of humanity. Because the most complex structures in existence are the human civilizations. When you think they have to pass them from generation to generation, you, you pass your language, you pass your literature, you pass the whole of your, your structure <coughs> of, of civil life. And that's why we can identify the Chinese, we can identify the, the Hindus, we can identify the Roman Empire, we can identify these worlds because they are incredible structures. There is no more sublime amazing structure in existence than that occurred when Islam was manifested as a world, as the abode of Islam, because it is the only universal civilization. We go back to the one, the manifestation of the one, and it is the only universal civilization from West Africa to China, one world, a world in which Ibn Battuta could travel and work all the way through from Morocco to China, a world in which all the different geographies, all the different languages, all the different religions were encompassed in this one world. And it is the greatest miracle and, the, and it is perfect as a form, as a structure, as a world, and we cannot see that mm. because that, um, uh, that this, this miracle has been obliterated from our uh, from And it's, our it's such a, a, a paradigm that is so different to our habitual ways of thinking Absolutely. in modernity. We find it hard to yeah. connect with that reality. And then you yeah. see that what happened was that actually the, 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 uh, the, the revelation was realized mm. as a world, and that world allowed the human drama to take place in all its richness. And every aspect of life could be lived to its fullness, including that of these very small group of people that we call philosophers, <laughs> who are the most dangerous people on the planet, <laughs> who in Islam mm. had this incredible journey through to the sublime synthesis, which is in my book, where the reasoning mind is completely resolved in its worship and knowledge of God mm. through the greatest thinkers mm. that have ever walked on this planet. And this is the story. 
So you have a, a world in which you had the, the greatest saints and the greatest despots mm. and rogues. Mm. This is the nature of the drama of human life. And the Darul Islam, the, the, this wonderful form, was able to encompass and, and have them all. Because you could always see the rogue and you could always see the saint. Mm. You could always see the good judge and you could always see the one who was corrupt. Because that balance, that mizan, that justice, was impregnated into the whole system, the structure. But to discover that structure and to realize what Darul Islam was is the great uh, work that this generation has to do. Mm. Because by recovering that, you recover the truth of what actually happened in humanity. And you realize that now, all of that knowledge, all of that uh, truth, that witness, the Muslim has to be so strong to be able to maintain the witness and to provide the refuge. When you have a storm, you send out the boats in order to bring people into the refuge. You don't dive into the ocean and join it. You have to protect it. And this is what Islam is. This is the, the way of life which we can practice and we do practice in our homes, in our colleges, and everywhere. We can practice it anywhere. Mm. This is the glory of Islam. You, you, you know, it's, it's complete. It's whole. Okay. Just, just a to, good moment to. Uh, yeah, we're just going to conclude. Uh, have a break uh, to, to pray, obviously, but we'll come back for Q and A. I just want to just to end with a uh, what I think is a really insightful review of your book, um, which I think sums up the positivity in your book. It says it is fair to say that the most important accomplishment of this comprehensive uh, work, this obviously, the product of Ahmed Paul Keeler's rich and varied experiences and lifelong readings on Western and Islamic studies, is its impressive attempt to instill self confidence in today's Muslims. I think the author here, the reviewer here, hits on something quite uh, important. This is arguably what Muslims, especially the youth, need most before coming to terms with modernity in one way or another, they write. Given this, it is important that Keeler's book is currently being translated into Malay, Turkish, Arabic and several other languages as well. Um, this book is a breath of fresh air for the contemporary Muslim psyche, where deep prejudices, prejudices about both the modern Western world and Islamic culture prevail. Uh, There's a guy, uh, um, Mustafa Metin, I think he's a Turkish writer in TRT World Research Center. But he, he, his, his whole point, your, your book is an impressive attempt to instill self-confidence in today's Muslims and also giving, giving us a narrative of mm -hmm. sure. the, the Western uh, history, the genealogy of, of our past, which is so important to understand, really. So thank you very much for that. We'll break now for uh, Maghrib, I think, and then we'll come back for Q&A, inshallah. So thank you. <laughs> Welcome back uh, to uh, this Blocking Theology special, uh, uh, Cambridge University. And this is the, the Q&A, question and answer session. Um, if you want to answer a question, uh, please just raise your hand and we have a roving mic uh, here uh, who will come to you. We'll do our best um, to get through as many questions as possible though. So um, any first questions? Anyone have a question? Yes, sister. So you touched on the legacies of Luther or the Protestant Reformation in the trajectories that we've seen in the West. Um, and a lot of people draw a parallel between the priesthood of all believers in Protestantism and the lack of a formal um, hierarchy in Islam. Um, as all individuals can access God um, without an intermediary. So how come that dimension of spiritual sovereignty that we have in Islam hasn't led to what we see in the West? Is it because we emphasize community in other ways? Gosh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful question. And I feel that I'm uh, not really the, you, you really need a theologian to answer this question beautifully. Um, I would say that now I'm going to try and answer it. Can you imagine? Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> um, I think you can say that because Islam, the whole structure of our worship and our belief system and our structure is so complete that the, there's no comparison because what happened in, in, uh, with Luther 
is that it really did become a kind of, you know, the, 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 the feelings, the passions with God. You know, believing in God. Mm. Whereas with us, it's a very different situation. Because as, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole question of Islam being the, the religion of submission, we submit to Almighty Allah. And we really do, in a sense, leave it up to Him. There's this fantastic, um, one of the things I loved about Islam when I entered it, because I came from a very much of a, of a theatre background. That, that was what I was very much involved in when I was young. And what I loved so much about Islam was the way in which it, it so clearly shows that Almighty Allah is the producer, the creator, the fashioner. It's His show. He is running this show and we are like actors. We're given our parts, you know? And so this sort of sense of, of, um, of, of submission which is so beautiful. It's, 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 a, it's an incredible thing, that submission. And it's one of the things which, if I might just divert at a moment, is the great power of the feminine, of the woman. Because the feminine is the perfection of submission. Men have to really work on it. But for women, it's within the very structure of their being. So I think uh, what I would say is that there is really no comparison because with, with what happened with uh, Protestantism is it got rid of everything that, that, that surrounded the, 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 the structure. It really got rid of all the structure. Mm. Whereas in Islam you've got this incredible, beautiful structure which encompasses the believer. I don't know whether that's... No, I, I, I agree, if I could dare to add to anything you said, but it's the, the, the sense of the individualism born with Martin Luther yeah. and the privatization of faith, it's between me and my God. Yeah. There, there is no real dean, there's no political, social, civilizational component, which there was during medieval, medieval European uh, phase. But also, there's a slight misapprehension. So the priesthood of all believers, that expression is found in the New Testament, of course. But actually, there is an intermediary between the believer and God, and that is Jesus. And he's seen as the high priest. So even, the, even with that conception in Protestant theology, you still go through someone else. You go through the high priest, which is Jesus. There is no direct connection with God in, the, in that sense in Islam. You always, there is an intermediary even in the Protestant conception, although they do away with the, ch the church and the sacraments and Mary and so on. There's still, there's still a mediator. It's just, anyway. Yeah, that makes sense. Should we go to uh, the brothers next, if there is a question? I just wanted to, it's just it probably just a clarification question, but you mentioned something about laboratory, you said what what's going on in the laboratories and then um, you didn't really clarify specifically, I don't know if you were just, um, later on you started talking about like the split between modern philosophy and like modern science, was that what you were referring to or was it something more specific with regards to laboratories? I don't know if you remember. Yeah, that's, yeah that, that's a very fair question. Humanity has been mesmerised by the power of modern science. It's like a mesmerization. You know that, those cartoon films when you know, the eyes start <laughs> going like this. And this mesmerization of the power, the, the, the unbelievable power, has mesmerized humanity. And when the Muslims, the world of Islam, was destroyed, it was through that power that had been released. And the Muslims were also mesmerized by the power. And what has happened is that that power, that entering into the, into the material realm, has got deeper and deeper. And in every laboratory, whether it's chemical, biological, whatever it is, they're going deeper and deeper into matter, into the material realm, and they are releasing more and more powers. But the problem is that the world that was promised, the promised land of modernity, which is heaven on earth, that's the promise. Progress leading to heaven on earth. That 
is clearly not happening. And so the spell of modernity is beginning to break. People are waking up and saying, what the Dickens is going, this is an, this is an insane asylum. An insane asylum. We're living in insanity. We're living in a world where machines are taking over everything. You talk, you're in a taxi with a taxi driver who says, well, you're, I'm, I'm finished. A few years' time, I'm not going to be driving this taxi. And the, the power of this, of, of modern science is going into everything. And, it's just, and, and it has no connection. Modernity doesn't connect. There's a beautiful saying of, of Dawson, the, the, the wonderful Catholic um, historian. Of the, uh, he, he, he was working in the 1930s, 20s. And he said the tragedy of modern man is that he is disconnected from heaven and he is disconnected from the earth. He's living in this kind of world of his own imagination. This has been created, this machine world, this world of modern science, which doesn't connect into anything. And it's now reaching a point of ultimate crisis in so many different fields. The Mizan understanding of it is one of the beautiful things of the Mizan is scale. Things have to be in scale, the human scale. The scale of when you enter a traditional building, a building that has been built by the hand, great cathedrals or great mosques or whatever it may be, you feel that sense of scale. The modern broke that scale. You now have machine time, machine scale, machine rhythm, which is completely breaks the mizan. But that mesmerization, that power, that promise to produce a, a better world. How long have you heard this idea, we're creating a better world? What do you mean a better world? We've turned our world into a garbage dump. We've polluted the oceans. We've destroyed the very air we breathe. How could this be better? So this is where all of this is coming out of the laboratories of Cambridge, the laboratories of, of all the universities throughout the world, in China, in Russia, everywhere. And this is why I say the storm is rising, it's getting greater because the power of science, of modern science, is increasing exponentially. So the major uh, message of, of my book is that the first thing is we are living in the age of crises. And those crises started to really manifest themselves when the atom bomb came into existence. When we found the, when we had the way, the means, the human beings had taken upon themselves the power to destroy everything. Up until that time, no, no such power existed. And since then, Almighty Allah has allowed the human being to go deeper and deeper and deeper into this world of destruction, where now we have a multitude of ways in which we can destroy ourselves. And we're literally walking. What, what is this new, new uh, center they have in Cambridge? The Center for Existential Risks. This is a center in Cambridge, set up by the uh, Astronomer Royal a few years ago. And they're looking at everything. And one of their big worries is AI. AI is, 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 is an ultimate killer because it is completely dehumanizing. And this is where when you come back to Islam and you see the, the beauty and the simplicity and the fact that the world, you see why it is so important to recover our understanding of what actually happened with the great civilization of Islam is that, that people must realize it was not always thus. People who are born now, they think that they only experience this. So they think that the world has always been chaos, not a bit of it. That Mizan was manifested completely and wholly. That is the rea reality. But it's a reality that's got to be hard won by your generation. Hard won. 
because it has got to be brought to the surface and shown. Why is it important? It is to give us the confidence and the realization that Almighty Allah is, tr is true, is real. These things have happened and we are now in the situation where we are the witness and the refuge in the storm. But the storm is being increased day by day, month by month, in the laboratories of the world. Assalamu alaikum. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you've made it clear that you're skeptical about philosophers and scientists, and rightly so. Um, but at the same time, um, a lot of um, like groundbreaking philosophy and um, science did come from like the Musli Muslim polymaths in the ninth century and in Andalusia and, and these places. And so I'm wondering if you think that in the modern world, can we have something similar where through the concept of Mazen, we're balancing science, philosophy um, and religion. And to give you a more example, like a more specific example, it's like, is there a world um, driven by Mazen where Einstein could have created his theories, but you know the atomic bomb wouldn't have been created? <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful question. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, the problem is we have a tremendous desire to put things right, which is a, an absolutely natural desire, and. Many times people have asked me, why, how can we apply Mizan to, to, to modernity, to make it Mizan? The answer that one has to give is you can't, because the whole structure of modernity is to break the Mizan. It's to break the boundaries. How often do you hear this? The whole language of modernity, innovation, you've got to break, change. Mm. You have to break, you have to break the limits, you have to go beyond the limits. In other words, you are breaking the Mizan. That is the very structure of modernity. That's the problem. So you can't get yourself, if you, you can't reform it. There are people within it who are desperately trying to pull back. There are those who see that we're at the very f the limit. I mean, you, know, you hear the scientists, you hear the, it is the scientists actually who are telling us the dangers we're in. It is the mind that produced the problem that is now telling us we have a big problem. That we're actually at the very, at the very verge of destroying ourselves. It's the scientific mind that is telling us this. And they're setting up. So I was often saying in Cambridge, you've got these two things happening. On the one hand, you've got all these societies like the uh, Antarctic Survey, which is dealing with uh, the global warming, dealing with the unintended consequences of the modern development and, and plunging into the matter, trying to deal with the problems. You've got the other part of the research establishment going deeper and deeper into, into matter, producing the next generation of unintended consequences. Because this is, the, this is what is happening. So there is no way in which you can reform modernity. It's, it's, it's fully manifested now. When I was young, as I told you, when I was a child in the 40s and 50s, it wasn't. It wasn't in the universities. The civilization, Latin and Greece, was still king. Half the nation went to church. Christian morality ruled when I was a child. But now modernity has actually produced its own version of morality, of ethics. That's why we've reached a point now where you can't you, we can't get away from the fact of the crisis. At every single level, that crisis is taking place. And that's why the Muslims have such a huge responsibility. <coughs> because we have a safe place. We have a connection with truth, with beauty, 
with goodness. Our religion is wholly intact. Our teachers are there. Our sheikhs are there. All over England I'm continually meeting extraordinarily Muslims. People who have knowledge and who are guiding their communities, their families, whatever it may be. Islam is fully alive. Alhamdulillah, it's his show. And a remarkable thing is happening in terms of Islam. All over the world it is being persecuted and yet it is growing. Even in India, it's growing. Because why? It is Al-Haq. And the Muslims are in the age of witness and refuge. A glorious age for the Muslims. Why? We have nothing to fear. It's a glorious age and it's the, the, the age which is most like it is a sublime age of Mecca. Mm. When the Prophet ﷺ was surrounded by the storm. Now the Muslims are surrounded by the storm. And we have to learn how to negotiate, how to navigate the rapids, how to deal with modernity so that we don't get caught up in it and pulverized by it, because it is literally destroying the soul. And in these final manifestations when it's gone into the moral sphere and it's taken over the ethical sphere, it's taken over the artistic sphere, it's taken all of these spheres which, de which, which go deep into the human soul. At that time, the chaos becomes immense. So for us Muslims, alhamdulillah, look what we have, how happy we can be, but what a responsibility. Almighty God has given us such a responsibility, but he's given us such a beautiful new generation of Muslims, young people. And what is the great benefit of youth? What is the great glory of youth? The glory of youth is that when you, when you come to this age that you're at here at the university, you see everything fresh. You can see very easily the problems. You can see the madnesses, the insanities. That's how we felt in the 60s. When I was a young man, we were looking at the world and saying, what the dickens is this? The Vietnam War was crazy. But now you're seeing the whole picture. You are actually facing the totality of the picture. And as Muslims, you have everything there to be able to beautifully, compassionately, with great love, as the Prophet ﷺ behaved during the Meccan period when he gave to his disciples the most important thing of patience and compassion for suffering humanity. That is the great thing we have to have as Muslims now. Great compassion and great gratitude to Almighty Allah for giving us Islam. But the compassion is the ultimate that we need now because humanity is suffering and is crazy and is going insane. But Alhamdulillah, when I look around me, and I've been in Cambridge now, my dear wife, with, we, we came here for her PhD 30 years ago. And I've seen the different generations and I've never seen a more beautiful generation than the one that we now have here in Cambridge. God bless you all. I uh, do reckon that Spanish for um, efforts to solve the, the tragedy of man of bringing heaven and earth together. Do you reckon perhaps there's been that we made some mistakes in um, re rectifying that tragedy by you know rejecting modernity and having this strong um, and very romantic longing for heaven, but not adequately um, combining it with any idea of how to connect it to, uh, to the earth so that. Do you, do you reckon that there's a there's a very strong feeling of rejecting modernity nowadays, but um, to actually tackle modernity, while there, there is a strong um, emotional sympathy for longing for heaven, where, do you reckon we're not adequately looking at historical Islamic precedent for how heaven and earth were connected, so that there's just a longing for an ideal 
but no vision for how it was actually reconciled in the past, if that makes sense? Uh, that's a very good question. The, the rejection of modernity is natural because people are beginning to see, the spell is, as I say, breaking, and people are beginning to see what it is. For the Muslim, what you're saying, the recovery of the realization that Islam succeeded and didn't fail, because there's a huge sense amongst the Muslims, and this is what I had when I became a Muslim, you know, 50 years ago when I entered and became engaged with Islam. The thing that really, uh, I got really sort of depressed because the Muslims were so depressed about their past. They were saying, you know, if we'd been good Muslims, we'd never have been conquered by the West. You know? They're saying, you know, after uh, the, the Prophet Sallallahu the minute the Omars came along, the whole thing went to pot. We had a golden age and then it all went into decline. This was the stories. I was thinking to myself, this is, this is ridiculous. I didn't come into Islam to join something that was a failure, something in which there's a, the, fine, the greatest manifestation, the greatest revelation from Almighty Allah through his greatest prophet وسلم, to the greatest of humanity at the time, went up like a rocket and then went down to earth and went like that. It's ridiculous. It's impossible. There has to be a proper story. And I saw that story through the art, the perfection of Islamic art, from West Africa through to China. Everywhere you saw it, the perfection of calligraphy, the perfection of geometry and design, the perfection of architecture, the beauty, the mizan. It was perfect, right through. Unity and diversity. So my work has been really over the last 50 years, because that I saw immediately, has been seeing how in every area the miracle of the Sharia, the most beautiful system for organizing human life that ever came into existence, the beautiful system of merchants and commerce in which you had the most remarkable thing on earth, which was the pious merchant. The merchant who was so close to his God that when they traveled, they took Islam with them. This is a remarkable thing. And the, the fact that more than half of all the funds within a Muslim state were in waqfs, trusts, for the benefit of the society. And then you look more and more into these different aspects and you see that each one is perfect and yet what holds it all together? This universal civilization. The Roman Empire when the political structure fell, the civilization collapsed. But Islam had hundreds of dynasties which came and went, but Darul Islam just continued. The way of life the system, the structure, remained. So it is the realization of this perfection of structure that was the, the glory of Islam, which manifests this beauty, and it's through everything. It's through the literature, it's through the poetry, and it's through the philosopher. Because that philosophers, those philosophers, were on a trajectory towards understanding him, Almighty Allah. That was their journey, and it's a fantastic journey. And people are now beginning to tell it. They're beginning to see it. All that was wiped out. All that knowledge was wiped out. So this is where you're right. When the discovery of that for the Muslim is going to enhance their whole belief and their structure and their gratitude and their amazement and their awe at the miracle of the, of the revelation when they see Islam for what it is in terms of its manifestation, their awe for the Almighty will be overwhelming. The religion is completely intact, but our understanding of the manifestation of Islam in history is completely confused and obliterated. Once that is discovered, that is the moment 
when the Muslims will have the strength to be the witness and the refuge in the storm that is unfolding. Does that answer your question? I think we've got time for just one more question, unfortunately, before we have to close. Was there a sister who had her hand up? I can't remember. Um, I have a question that's a bit more practical, perhaps, just to end the conversation. Um, it seems like in this storm, one big aspect of it has been the eradication of certain epistemologies. So I can think, for example, that there's been so much epistemic violence in this Western conquest of the global south and, and Islam in particular. And so one example that I can think of in particular is I remember learning that um, one of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, said that they used to teach their children about the Ghazawat, the expeditions, the battles of the Prophet وسلم, just as they would teach them the Quran. So just to give an example of how important it was to teach, for example, something like the philosophy of, of warfare. How do you behave? How, how does an army behave in warfare? Something that I think is pretty much eradicated. I cannot think of someone in my own circle who really knows about this nowadays. And so in this, on this road of spiritual recovery, how do we, um, first of all, recover this for ourselves, recover these epistemologies for ourselves, but then also engage um, the Western world? For example, I think in my own studies, I, I, I work with people who, who are doing leadership studies, for example. They talk about sustainability a lot. So it seems like they understand and they recognize that there is a loss of balance but our epistemologies are so seem so foreign to them that they almost cannot comprehend um, or even begin to comprehend where we're coming from. So how do you engage with, with the others? Gosh, the, it's a beautiful question and it requires a, 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 it requires a great teacher to, to give you a, a proper answer. And you have them, they're, they're here. The, 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 not in this room. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> saying you know, to, together we're we're both in a sense sort of. You know, but this is something. This is something. Question. But the, you've put your finger on one thing, which is really critical: children, childhood. Because when I grew up as a child, chil childhood was still off. It was it was off limits for the for the uh, the commercial the the world out there. Childhood was protected. And childhood was the domain of the, of the women. And the men were there to protect it. And one of the most horrific things that have happened is the modern invasion of childhood. I call it the dialysis of the imagination. Children up until the age of seven in Islam and in any traditional world that knows about children are in a they're almost more with Almighty Allah inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajun we talk about this as being you know when we return we come from Almighty Allah and these little children they've arrived from Almighty Allah and with, in Islam, the, 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 uh, they don't, the, the mother doesn't move for how many days is it? 40 days? Everything is brought to her. The child is there. And the barakah of a, of a baby, a child, is beyond imagining. I mean, we, we've all experienced this. The barakah of a child. And then that child grows uh, over seven years. And the child has this imagination this soul, this sense, this beauty, and its senses. And they live, they can see, they can imagine things which when they go beyond seven and they move into the next stage of discernment, they can't remember. And their games and their imagination, they can become princes, they can become, you know, they can turn a, a piece of wood into the most magical sword, they can, they can turn anything into anything and they play amongst themselves and the little ones follow the older ones and then the little ones as they grow up they become the older ones and a whole society is formed in that childhood amongst those children in their world which we as adults have no access into 
We cannot enter into their imaginations as children. They see things. They taste things. They, they, their senses are so alive. Everything goes directly into them. And then they had the age of discernment. And then in Islam, you educate them. Up until that time, you don't force them to pray or anything. You, the education begins after seven, when they enter the age of discernment. But modernity had to turn the human being into a consumer. So modernity created its own version of childhood. It started to produce these, these toys, these plastic creations which are complete. Funny noises and cars, beep, 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 all these funny things. The child looks, is mesmerized. It's like giving them heroin. They're mesmerized, excited by it. And then they get bored with it. And, they go, and then you have to bring them another one. And then another one. And then, why? Because you're giving them a complete thing. There is nothing for their imagination. Their imaginations, they become dependent upon an external imagination. And the child then gets, as, as the, the modern becomes more and more sophisticated, it then finally produces this. And I've seen three-year-olds with it, mesmerized. Not their imagination, the dialysis of the imagination. The child then arrives at the age of discernment. It has no, its imagination has been destroyed. It doesn't have that society that it had traditionally, that play society, that, that theatre of childhood. And so when it reaches the next phase, the adolescent phase, 13, 14, and you get this huge change that starts to take place, it rebels. The time when traditionally the child, the young person, makes the connection with the adult, becomes the apprentice to the adult. The hero is the adult. They want to be an adult. They want to be a carpenter, or they want to be a soldier, or they want to be something. They want to be like their uncle. At that moment, they create their own society. That's when they start creating friends. And parents say, I don't like Johnny's friend. He's, he's not very nice. And Johnny's parents say, I don't like Freddie's friend. Uh, he's, not, he's not a good influence. And they create their own world. And they then go through a period of adolescence when the parents are literally shaking, not knowing what their children are going to do, whether they're going to be on drugs, they're going to be this, they're going to be that, the, ch the girl's going to get pregnant, or whatever it may be. Terrible period. <coughs> when that child should be going through the point where it actually arrives at adult beautifully, ready for maturity. So what I say is the most important thing when people ask me, what's to be done? Reclaim childhood. Reclaim childhood. And the Muslims can do this because Muslim society is still somewhat intact, but reclaim childhood, because the greatest shame upon the human is the destruction of childhood. That's, my, that's the, the thing that haunts me most. I have nine grandchildren. This It's like, it's like poison for the children. Not very good for the adults either, but it's for the children it's a, it's a catastrophe. I'm no. sorry, I can't answer all of your questions because it's such a beautiful question. But ask your teachers, ask your sheikhs. They will give you the proper answers. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Ahmed uh, Paul Keeler. I think we can give a round of applause. <laughs> And I do recommend, I'm sure you've heard of it, but I do recommend Rethinking Islam in the West, a new narrative 
for the age of crises. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, do read it. It is very readable, actually. It's not stodgy or, you know, academic in the worst sense. It's actually very readable. So I, I do recommend it if you want to, to pursue further these themes you discussed tonight. So thank you very much.